And this guy was observing me for a while. And because I had that penalty on my head, they were trying to murder me multiple times before. There were knives thrown at me. Well, he joined the club, if you will, and he comes to me. He says, I have a pistol right here. And the next time I see you, I'm going to shoot you myself. So next time you dare to come here to this place, you're dead. I knew that he was very serious. I knew the guy. He was known in the area. And I prayed and I said, God, if you don't want this guy to shoot me next time I show up and I have to show up because you told me to. So I have no option. Please help me. So <laughs> I woke up in the morning after my prayer and uh, I look in the newspapers and behold, this guy's face is right in front of the newspapers, local newspapers in Calgary. What happened was the police did a raid on that area. And behold, they find out that he was in a possession of an illegal pistol. <laughs> he got arrested for possession wow. and some other drug-related um, crimes. So that's how God uh, rescued me. And I am truly honored to have back on this man of God, Pastor Archer Palowski. Uh, truly a dear friend, like family to me. We just bumped into each other in Miami at Clay Clark's event recently. And we were just talking about some of the testimonies I've never heard him share before. Miracle stories. I mean, signs and wonders that the Lord did during the seven times fiery furnace, which he very much is still going through, right? This man of God really takes one to save a nation. It takes one to shake a nation as well. And so um, if you haven't heard of Pastor Archer Pulowski, I highly suggest you Google him because you have definitely seen some of the videos because it went ultra viral around the world. One of them, his most well-known one being the get out video that was filmed during a church service when he refused to close his church during COVID. He was also arrested and summoned for baptizing his daughter. He was also arrested and summoned because he was feeding the homeless in Canada and Calgary. That's right. It is illegal to feed the homeless in Canada. So this man of God really stood up to the people in charge, the courts, right? police officers, everything that they're saying you cannot do, preaching in public, you cannot do, thrown in prison multiple times. I mean, millions and millions of dollars in fines. And on top of that, his boldness really activated the demons in people, really activated the demon possessed. He had gangsters trying to kill him with a two by four with nails. God miraculously saved him. He's had my goodness, he's had police officers, police officers that lied about him that ended up getting in trouble themselves. Um, he had situations where he had someone literally threatened to kill him. It was a well-known drug dealer in the neighborhood, told him, I'm going to kill you tomorrow if something miraculous happened the next day. I mean, there's going to be such incredible miracles and testimonies he's going to share with us. So without further ado, I want to welcome Pastor Archer Palowski. I know that you're finally home. Thank God. It was a miracle. I even saw you in uh, in Miami. You were under house arrest. They were trying to throw you in prison for 12 years. Can you just give us an update on that? Uh, me coming to America again, it is a miracle. And I'm really excited about this show because quite often people ask me about the whole ordeal, the fights, the standing, the courage, the boldness, you know, <clears throat> what happened in prison. Um, but you wanted to, you know, plow the field of miracles and miracles do happen. God is still the same yesterday, today and forever. He's an unchangeable God. He's God of signs and wonders. He's God of miracles. And when you stand your ground in his name, miracles will be following you just like he promised that those that believe the miracles will follow them wherever they go. So me coming to Miami, it was a miracle because the Canadian government for the past 18 years tried everything in the power. I mean, 16 arrests, many times I was detained, 340 citations, 120 court cases. I have been charged with everything you can imagine, including terrorism, inciting mischief, breach of probation, <clears throat> you know, the whole nine yards criminally for keeping the church's doors open for baptizing my daughter for feeding the poor for giving bibles away for reading bible in public i was arrested by <clears throat> seven police officers 
I faced a year of imprisonment uh, for that horrible uh, crime. So I have been in and out of hell, uh, sort of speak, plowing and seeing God's deliverance and miracles. The Crown Prosecutor during the last trial wanted me in prison. The judge told us that he has 12 years at his disposal. And they really, really wanted me in prison. I mean, that's why they tried to bribe me for the past nine, 10 months after I was released from prison and I was put on house arrest. I was on house arrest for a year and a half since my release from imprisonment. Mm -hmm. The government did everything that the government can including trying to murder us. Uh, five different inmates already testified uh, that the guards were giving them incentives to murder me, to beat me up in prison. As you know, I was kidnapped by sheriffs placed in Maxpot for the most dangerous terrorists in the country in freezing conditions uh, where outside was minus 28 and I was sitting there, you know, freezing to death. Um, and then I was eventually released a place on house arrest so everything was stacked against me i faced over 40 citations during the big lie and i was facing 12 years of imprisonment but you see <clears throat> those were the things that the devil wanted but god had a totally different uh, different plan <clears throat> for my life uh, so when um we did the jericho march on the 17th of September, on the 18th, Monday morning, I was to appear before the judge where I would find out my fate. And I had a dream. And I have not shared that dream with many people. I'll share it with you because it's another miracle that happened. I don't have many dreams. And when I do, they're sometimes crazy and very prophetic. So here it is. I was standing by a shore and there was a, a beach, a sand, and an ocean. And the beach was very dirty. The sand was very dirty. You could see the footprints. You, you, you could see dirt all over. And a big wave came and washed all of it away, leaving no marks, cleaning it beautifully. You couldn't even see the footprints and then i've heard a voice and the voice said this to me that 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 there will be not even a trace and so that was the night before i met my fate i delivered a sermon in the morning we did the church service and we had worship i went inside hundreds of people showed up and then the judge was deliberating with the crown prosecutor and the lawyers back and forth about what should be appropriate fate you know sentence uh, for my horrible crimes you gotta remember that the judge already found me guilty of terrorism he found me guilty on inciting and of breach of release order so i was facing 12 years of imprisonment well something bizarre happened because the judge stops everything and says i need to go now outside and discuss the sentencing with others and i am a little bit of an expert now or seasoned criminal I have been in so many trials <clears throat> for feeding the homeless and preaching the gospel. I have seen it all. And this is the first time where the judge stops everything and just goes outside to talk to some other people. We don't know who those people are. We don't know who was in that room. <clears throat> but when he came back, pretty much he said 61 days. And that means time served. Um, I remember the fixers, the fixers were calling me back and forth and they said, we own the judge, the judge is bought and paid for, and he was ordered to lock you back in prison. They tried to blackmail me, they tried to coerce. After the, uh, the bribery didn't work, so I was offered a guaranteed seat at the legislature, I was offered money, I was offered a government job. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, so you had you had the judge who stepped out to make a phone call to talk, which, by the way, a few months before that, you were, uh, we have a mutual friend, Pastor Ruth, who, and she's my pastor, actually, who prophesied, and I'm sure there were others as well, that 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 the that there's going to be people around the world, international nations and countries and, and, and uh, politicians that are going to put pressure on Canada to release you. And sure enough, that's what happened. But with the story with the fixers, that's a separate story. So the fixers, when you announced your political run that you were going to actually start a new party in Canada, that's when these fixers came. So what happened when they came to you? And then 
what 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 they said actually uh, the bribery and the um, uh, blackmail happened when i announced that i'm going to run for political office <clears throat> so first uh, they wanted me to cross uh, the floor they wanted me jo to join the conservative party which is like your um you know um, republican party but here in Canada, that's the party that actually did this to us. So it was a conservative party that locked us up, muzzled us, and, and murdered people, and are still murdering people as we speak right now. So they offered me a job at the government, $250,000. They offered me a guaranteed seat as an MLA at the legislature if I cross the floor, if I abandon the people, the freedom people, and join the political party that is a ruling party right now, then I will have a guaranteed seat. When that didn't work, uh, that was about 10 different meetings throughout this 10 months period. If I didn't, you know, when I didn't bite, they started to blackmail, the coercion started to happen and, and the threats. So the last conversation I had with those people from government was um, pack your bags. The judge was told to lock you up. And we own the judge, he's bought and paid for, and he was told to eliminate you from the board. Apparently, I was told that there was a meeting uh, between the ex-premier, so that's like your governor, and ex-prime minister, that's like your president, and with the new wannabe or the appointed, selected prime minister to be Pierre Polyevre, and uh, they discussed me and they decided I am too dangerous for the conservative movement. I'm exposing corruption. I'm talking about what's really going on about WEF and the global agenda of you will own nothing and you will be happy, uh, climate um, lies and all those different things. And they decided to lock me back in prison. But God had a different plan for my life. And I think that's what we're going to talk about today because sometimes when you go to the fire, Sometimes when you are being told to bow before the establishment or golden image, like during the time of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, done by the King Nebuchadnezzar, you have an option. You can bow, and sometimes the evil will give you another opportunity to do the right thing, in quote, to bow before the golden image. But I love the response from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were told by the King Nebuchadnezzar, who will take you, who will rescue you from my hands? And I take this as a challenge. I think that God took it as well. Nebuchadnezzar challenged God to a duel. Yeah. And, um, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their response is so fascinating. They said, well, I know this, oh great king, that either God will rescue us or not, um, we do not know, but we will not bow before your golden image. And off they go to the fire. But let's stop here for a second, yeah. because that's where the miracles kick mm -hmm. in. When you stick with God of the miracles, when you stick with God of signs and wonders, when you stick with God of life itself, nothing else really matters. Those men were willing to die for their faith, for God. They refused to bow before the idols. Mm -hmm. And it was in the fire that God dealt with their enemies. Yeah. It was in the fire that Jesus shows up. Because remember, they were handcuffed or bound, shackled, thrown into the fire. And it was in the fire that God set them free it was in the fire that i had a personal encounter with the living god and also was in the fire not outside the fire in the fire that they have become the biggest testimony during that time mm -hmm. for the whole world to see and to hear that there is a living god creator of heavens and the earth and also which we miss as a christians that's where they're promotion was yes. in the fire so instead of running away from the fire and missing the miracles we should run towards the fire gladly if that's what is happening in our lives even though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i fear i'll fear no evil because god is there with me and, uh, and that's pretty much my story every single time the enemy wanted to hurt us we stood our ground we stood on the foundation of the Bible, on the word of God, 
on the truth, which he is the truth. And it was scary. Amen. They tried to burn us alive, as you remember. They unscrewed tires in our pickup truck and the and the wheel just took off on its own while driving. I was physically attacked, knives, pistols, you name it, and imprisonments, mm -hmm. solitary confinement, metal cages, psych ward, max spot for the most dangerous terrorists, arrested. My record is 120 police officers, anti-terrorists and the chief of police at our church service. I mean, this is hard to beat, but all of this happened for one purpose and one purpose only. So we can give glory to God and show to the whole world that God is bigger than the enemy. Oh my, amen. You couldn't have said it any better. It's so good because God gets to show off his faithfulness and his power and his love to, towards his people. And you know what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he, they, they honored the king, even though the king was wicked, right? They humbled themselves and they did not compromise. And that's when you said, like, just like in the fire, the Lord met them there. So we're going to talk about so many miracles. These are incredible testimonies, you guys, that I didn't even know when we were, we were sitting and chatting a few weeks ago. I was like, oh my goodness, you have to share this. So let's jump into the first one. When you were arrested, just like Apostle Paul in, in prison, he, he was singing and praising the Lord. What happened when you were singing in jail? Well, first of all, you got to remember, Anne, I um, I only can go by the Bible because in a Western, you know, society, we don't have many examples of what to do when you get arrested for preaching the gospel, what you are to do when you get arrested for reading the Bible, feeding the poor, right? So I read the Bible, and when the police officers arrested me, I decided, okay, um, well, I need to do what apostles were doing so what were they doing well they were singing well i'm a horrible singer i'm one of the worst i think you know if you want to get the people running for their lives you put me on a mic and tell me to sing uh, i will do it um uh, what else well they were preaching they were praying they were you know I'm sure you're laying hands on the sick uh, so God can perform his miracles. So when I was put in prison, in jail, in a police custody, I decided to do the same thing. But before I was taken there, God gave me a vision about the police officer. And I did not share that with you about this story. So we're driving the police officer. I'm handcuffed. Um, I'm charged with criminal offenses for reading the Bible. I became the first Canadian in 2006 to be arrested and charged criminally for, for reading the Bible. So I'm driving over there to the police custody and God gives me a vision. I didn't ask for it. I was not really praying for any visions, but it happened. And I saw the police officer that arrested me, the one that was driving the cruiser. I saw what happened when he was a little boy, about five years old. And I shared that with him and he freaked out. He yells at me, how do you know this? Who told you about this? He stops the car, shaken, completely shaken, and leaves the vehicle, leaving me in the middle of downtown, locked and handcuffed, and he just takes off. And I said, oh, God, now I've done it. Not only I am handcuffed, but I'm locked in a police cruiser, and now I am abandoned inside that car with no escape no way to come out um in the middle of downtown but he called and he came back and we started to talk so i told him what i saw and and i told him what god wanted him to hear but it was a fascinating story because that changed this man completely he freaked out he didn't know what was going on and why i would know details about what happened to him when he was a little boy and there is more to this story. I was handcuffed. And I don't know if you had the privilege being handcuffed, but those handcuffs are um, made with very strong steel. So I'm being taken um, to the police to be processed. And usually what happens is they take the handcuffs off of you so you can be checked by paramedics. And that's exactly what happened. He takes the handcuffs off and they're all completely twisted. Like literally, like some strong men would twist the metals and they are not, you cannot use them anymore. So he takes the handcuffs and he's looking at them and says like, 
what did you do with my handcuffs? And, then, and I said, well, I was biting them with my teeth. And then, uh, and then I said, that was the power of, of love. Um, so that was the first, you know, or second miracle during that arrest. Then I was processed and put in, in cell with other inmates. Mm -hmm. And of course, again, I didn't know what else to do than just to follow the steps of the apostles. So I started to preach. And I raised my voice and, of course, concrete resonates, metal bars and like the Hollywood style cells you would remember from the movies. And that, that was the police station in downtown core. So I'm preaching and I don't know for how long I just told them whatever was on my heart about Jesus. And, and then I stopped and I thought, that's it. My job is done. I'm not singing because they will kill me there if I start singing. But I will just... Um, I did my share, I preached, and, and that's it. So what happened was, from another cell, a man yells and says, Preacher, are you still there? And I said, yes, I'm there. Uh, God did not open the doors yet. And he said, yelling, well, then preach it. Preach it again. So I did preach. I preached, believe it or not, in three different cells for 23 hours straight, uh, to a point that... Um, <clears throat> Every few sermons that I would give, some new clients, if you will, more inmates would come, a fresh, um, a fresh meat, as they call it, and I would have to start all over again. One native man was super upset, totally drunk, but big fella, and he says, I'm going to punch your head off, and he punched next to my ear, and I said, oh boy, I'm in trouble. I don't want to fight this guy. Um, I don't want to make a scene it's going to be bloody, very small cell, other inmates there. So you know what I did? I just said, in the name of Jesus, go to sleep. And I pointed the finger at him and I said, I command you to go to sleep. And you wouldn't believe it. The guy drops to the ground, lays at my feet like a dog and falls asleep. Not only him, but everybody else in a cell falls asleep at the same time. So... I knew that I knew. It, 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 it reminds me of, of even Paul, he said, just, just blindness, bam, and blindness would come. I mean, just the authority and, and the power of God. Praise God. Go ahead, continue. Come yeah, so um, there, there's so many other stories I want to share with you with, with arrest, because sometimes when you look at um, bad events, right, and arrest for reading the Bible, arrest for, you know, feeding the poor or, or preaching the gospel is a horrible thing. But if you stick with God, if your life is, you know, obedient to the will of God, it doesn't matter what the enemy wants, what matters is what God wants, and he always wants to use us in a big, miraculous, um, you know, position, situation, uh, way. So I'm taken to another, I was taken to another cell, I did the same thing, and on the next cell, uh, in the next cell, there were a bunch of young people, and one of them and that was early in the morning, so I was super tired. I preached probably 20 sermons already or more. I'm very tired. Um, I did not have anything, you know, any sleep. I didn't eat anything. There was nothing to drink, not much. And uh, I'm sitting over there and I said, okay, God, when is this going to end? And this guy starts to yell and scream. And he says, I'm going to kill myself. I have nothing to live for. And uh, that's it. My life is done. And he was yelling for, I don't know, half an hour like this. And it was a really super annoying. So to a point that I said to him, fine, shut up. I will help you to die. I'll put your head in a, wash, in a toilet and I'll hold it underwater so we can get rid of you and have some quiet time. Well, he stops yelling and he's looking at me and starts crying. And that was my opening. Then I ministered to him. It turned out he was 22 years old. He was um, charged with selling narcotics. That was his second offense. So he was going away for a few years. And, uh, and he says his life is over. I said, no, young man, your life is just the beginning. Use this time to study. Use this time to learn God, about God. Read the Bible and you can change your entire life. You can finish your, you can finish university uh, during this time in prison and change your completely change your life. And you know he completely changed. When they chained him, 
with other inmates to take him to prison, he yelled at me and says, uh, Art, are you still there? And I said, yes, I am. He says, I want you to know I was listening and I thank you. And off he went um, to, to his destiny. Um, so that was that time I was eventually released, charged, and I faced my um, opposition in a court. I was vindicated. And um, the police officer that arrested me was charged with three counts himself because he lied about the arrest. He manufactured stuff and the camera was rolling and he was charged himself. We end up in a court for him this time and I was a witness and I was supposed to testify about what he did to me. But God spoke to me the day before and he said, I want you to forgive him and I want you to release him. So I wrote a statement to the judge about what happened and about what God told me. So we arrived, there is a panel of judges from the police. There is this guy, the police officer that arrested me. Uh, there was lawyers and, and me as a witness. And I said to the judges, well, before I'll testify, before I'll say anything, I have a statement to read. And they said, but that's not allowed. I said, then, then it's over because I'm not going to testify. And you know, and I'm a very stubborn man if I want to be. <laughs> and I said, I'm not, I'm not going to say a word. If you will not allow me to read my statement, then, um, then we can all go home. <clears throat> so they stopped. They went to <clears throat> ask some, um, some higher ups what to do. They came back and they said, fine, you can read your statement. And in a statement, I said, I don't seek this man's job. I forgive him. I want to move on. And I want him to learn from this, not to lie and not to do evil. And the guy started to cry. The guy completely broke, came to me, gave me a bear hug. And, uh, and that's how the story ended because they did not have a witness. I refused to testify against this man. And um, he was reinstated and, and moved on with his life. I moved with mine. Was Another that, time, was, wait, wait, was that the same police officer that you had the vision when he was five years old? Yes. So, wow. So he, 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 he you ministered to him on the way to the jail. He's still lying. He still wrote the paperwork, said you did something, manufactured stuff. Your video proved otherwise. And then God said to forgive him and let him go. Wow. Yeah. Glory be to God. How the Lord flipped everything over, but then the Lord showed his mercy again. Amazing. Yes. I saw him some years later and um, he was completely a changed, changed man. Um, um, I have been arrested many times, but here is an interesting arrest that um, I find it fascinating. We were feeding the homeless in hell in one of the ghettos where the police doesn't want to show up, where there are rapes, murders, gangs, dealing drugs, like really, really bad. Um, so that's where we set up our shop, um, in quote, as the media were calling our church services. And we had a barbecue and we would be feeding hundreds of people, just like we do uh, to this day right now. And police showed up. They blocked the entire street streets they brought german shepherds they commanded the german shepherds the dogs to bark it was loud it was crazy and they came to me and they said that um i have to stop feeding the people because it's against the bylaws in the city of calgary giving free goods and services is prohibited by law so if i pray for someone publicly i'm breaking the law if i wait, give wait, wait. Sandwich, wait wait you you can't pray for anyone and you can't even give food to the homeless it's against the law in canada that's right you're not allowed to even pray in public because that's giving services for free to others also you're not allowed to give a sandwich to a dying child on the streets of uh, Canadian cities uh, because that's prohibited by law. Uh, there's also a law that says um, that printed material, you're not allowed to distribute printed material. When we do church services, we give gospel tracts, we give Bibles away. Well, that's also prohibited by law. Um, the cities have bylaws that say um, that certain signs are offensive. And there is a law against that. So I was ticketed uh, multiple times, $10,000 tickets for having offensive signage. And the signage sign said, Jesus loves you. According to the Canadian government, Jesus is offensive. 
and it's an offensive signage, therefore $10,000 ticket. So anyway, I went through hell uh, back and forth. But going back to the story, the police officers, high-ranking police officers came and they said they got orders to arrest me if I will not stop feeding the poor. So I said, well, I kept preaching. I was standing on a pickup truck and I said, well, I guess then you will have to arrest me. And the police moved to arrest me. But between the police me preaching standing on the pickup truck and then stood a man his name was maurice maurice was an ex-drug dealer that i baptized and he was converted under our ministry and there's thousands of people that came to the lord under the street church ministry so here's one of them and he said to the police um you're not touching my pastor you're not going uh, through you're not going to take my pastor away unless you go through me. So they very quickly went through him, slammed him on a, a hoodie of a police cruiser. He got arrested. They came, they jumped on a pickup truck, arrested me and arrested my brother David only because he recorded them. Remember, we record every encounters that we have with authorities because they are liars. They are pathological manipulators. And if you don't have the evidence, they have no problem to lie to the judges on a stand. Absolutely no problem to lie. So anyway, three of us were arrested, three different cruisers, and we were taken to the police station. And here is what happened. We were locked in three separate solitary cells and concrete. So, you know, knowing what is going to happen, um, usually they would keep me 24 hours in um, in jail. So I put my hands on the back. I put my feet up on the table, uh, interrogating room, and I started to sing. I know I I don't know why I started to sing. I just just didn't feel like preaching anymore. I just I was by myself, so I thought no one will hear it, and I kind of liked it. It was you know, resonating from the car concrete. And I was very loud, very loud, but I liked it. I thought it was not bad for me. So I'm singing King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus, you know, and the police officer opens the door shaken, physically shaken. And he says to me, you're not allowed to preach here. You're not allowed to sing here. And I said, well, you invited me in. So he slams the door and leaves when he opened the door i heard my brother david preaching wow. so i knew david is preaching i was singing and maurice the ex-drug dealer was singing with me and he is as horrible singer as i am so two of us were singing five minutes literally five minutes later the high-ranking police officer opens his opens the doors and he has papers in his hand and he's looking at me and I, I did not stop. I kept singing. And he says, you're disrupting the entire police station. No one can work because of your singing. The whole thing is messed up. We can't do anything. We want you out. And I look at him and I said, no, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> and he is puzzled. He doesn't know how to deal with that. And I said, what about my brothers? And he's thinking, 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 okay, fine. All of you out. So we were released, uh, cell phone keys were given to us, and then they wanted to kick us out. And I said, no, 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 no. Now you're going to hear before we go what wrong you have committed, what kind of evil you have committed. You arrested a preacher for feeding the poor and giving people hope. That's crazy. And they stood over there, and I gave them a mini five minutes sermon of what wrong they have committed. So we move on. I became probably the first human ever being kicked out from prison for singing. I've never heard anyone ever. The opposite um, of American Idol, right? Or Canadian Idol, right? The opposite. <laughs> totally. I think, uh, I, I, I think I'm the only one ever to be literally kicked out from jail for singing. Um, which I find it hilarious. Absolutely. Anyway, um, months later, I would spot this guy, this high-ranking police officer in a crowd, and he was undercover. And we were preaching 
outdoors so he could hide behind the tree and here and there but i could always see him and that was going on for about eight months and christmas came and during christmas um he comes with his female officer in uniform they drove through the sidewalk and came to me and here's what he said he says if i if i knew what kind of a man you are and that you actually are the only person that makes any sense if it comes to homelessness, I would never ever arrest you. And he became our police spy for I think about five years. Every time the police officers, high ranking, wanted to do something evil, tried to harm us this way or that way, I would receive a phone call from him or he would come to my lawyers and we would strategize how to avoid the entrapments and all kinds of different evil things uh, that um, the police officers uh, try to unfold on us. Also, another story. Uh, wait, from... actually, wait, so stop right there. So that, that that's actually one of the stories I wanted to ask you about was the police spy story. Look how amazing that is, you guys. <laughs> you actually had an informant in the police department. Normally, it's the other way around. Who was helping you? Um, does that police officer still, still actually maybe not go there? But um, you you did say that you could share it publicly, so thank you for sharing that. But go ahead, another story. Go ahead. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. So so that's the same officer. He's a high ranking police officer that was in charge of the sting operation of arresting us, taking us to prison. That's the same police officer that opened the door when I was singing, trying to kick us out for my wonderful Canadian you know voice and uh and that's the same one that was listening to my sermons for about eight months and eventually he came to tell me that um if he knew who i really was he would never do this evil that um the superiors uh, wanted him to do uh, there's another part of that story because the same night i <clears throat> i always preached against drug trafficking I always exposed dealers and preached against that. And um, they hired an assassin on my life for exposing that. And those people came, I think it was seven or eight of gangsters that came with knives, knives already out, ready to stab. And they came at the right moment. They already moved to attack us when the police showed up. So we were being arrested literally in front of the gang members that came to murder us, but they were stopped because of the stink police operation. The, we were arrested on Friday, released the same night, kicked out from, from jail for singing. But Sunday, we were back on the streets preaching. And the head of the gang, so the number one boss, came marching towards me and i said oh boy that's it he's going to kill me he's going to stop me now or shoot me and he comes to me very quickly grabs my hand and shakes it vigorously and he said you must be a good guy because we were watching how the police treated you and they treat you treated you with such a hate you must be one of us. You must be a good guy. Wow, these are and gangster. This is the mob boss that came with the two by fours with the nails on it to kill you with the stabbing, with the, with the knives. Wow. Yes, and so because the gangsters saw how the police treated us, in their mind, we kind of were elevated to the same position that they were because if the cops hate them the same way they hate us we must be the good guys and i just could only say to this guy thank you jesus you know for for changing the whole situation because it was very dangerous those people really wanted us dead and because of the police actions they changed their minds and they decided not to kill us. So look, in just one horrible situation, Anne, in yeah, just yeah. one bad thing that enemy wanted to do, look how many amazing miracles <laughs> happened, unfolded for the future. Oh, so good. And you know, the word says that when your ways delight the Lord, he will make you at peace even with your enemies. So amazing. You have another story about Someone committed a double homicide and your whole entire church was taken into custody. What happened with that? 
Yeah, so we, like I said, we set up a church with speakers, cross, pickup truck, food, barbecues in the middle of hell, literally. It was called the Needle Park because the needles, you couldn't go anywhere without stepping on a needle. That's why it was called the Needle Park. Police refused to show up. It was bad, bad, bad. Uh, we uh, put a cross between about 50 drug dealers and 50 prostitutes. So that just gives you an idea how horrible that place was. And then suddenly, and we preached there four times a week. And then one night, a lady runs towards us, uh, was preaching on a mic and yells, they're murdering them. They're murdering them. They murdered him. So we run and I took the camera with me. I always had the camera in my hand when there was something going on. And we run to see what's going on. And believe it or not, the, there was some kind of a drug deal go, uh, gone wrong and they slashed each other. And two men were murdered right under the bridge next to the church service. And I watched this one man die in front of my eyes. And then we were attacked. We were attacked viciously as well. We had to defend ourselves. And then, of course, police showed up. And because we were witness, because this happened when the church was there and feeding of the poor. And I remember you can still watch that sermon. It's still on, uh, I believe it's still on, on the Internet, double homicide. Does God, uh, double homicide, I think that's how it's called. And um, police showed up. <clears throat> they fenced the entire um, area. They taped it, including the pickup truck from the church, the barbecues, the whole nine yards. And they took the entire church as witnesses to the police station. Um, but why is this such a miracle? Well, because that gave us an opportunity to witness to I don't know how many police officers, detectives. All night we were preaching, witnessing, sharing, and the detective was so impressed that he actually gave me a ride home himself. And so very horrible, evil thing that was turned around to, to save other lives. And um, another part of the story is that those people that were murdered were during that night at our lineups. They've heard the gospel and God gave them the last opportunity to turn their li lives around and um, and come to Jesus. You know that they died for 60 Canadian dollars. 60 Canadian dollars, that's about 40 American bucks. $40, mm -hmm. two men slashed, murdered, just like that. You know, it's a horrible lifestyle, um, the, the business of sin. Um, so um, there is more to the story. Mm -hmm. It was all over the news and media showed up because they wanted to know what happened and we were the only witnesses willing to talk to what happened and i was able to literally preach the gospel to millions of canadians for a week we are on the news in and out in a papers national papers you name it and i was able to preach the gospel to millions of canadians including at the time where the funeral was happening and, and the media showed up again and I was able to warn them about drugs. I was able to talk about Jesus and forgiveness and a different lifestyle. So horrible thing that happened turned into the biggest evangelistic crusade that I had during that time. Um, so that's the double, double homicide. Yeah. Wow. Glory to God. I mean, the Lord always gives chances after chance after chance, but what the enemy has planned for evil, God uses it for good. There's another story, Pastor. You were attacked at, at, at the church with someone who had a butcher knife and he wanted to stab your friend, but you did something with the frozen chicken. What happened? Yeah, you know, sometimes <laughs> when you read the Bible, <clears throat> you wonder, well, if this happened to me, how I would react or is there some kind of a playbook? Okay, if someone wants to stop you, what you are to do? Um, well, there is none. You 
rely on God's mercy and you do your best to protect lives. And I've done it many times. And this time there was a young fella. We were already packing. That's why I was packing frozen chickens on a pickup truck. It was um, after the church service. And this young fella comes with a butcher knife. I mean, big, huge butcher knife. knife and he was ready to stab my friend, um, a father of four kids, and he was ready to stab him. Right here, I looked at the knife, and he was ready to make his move. And I just, I, I tell you the truth, I didn't have time to pray. I didn't have time to analyze the situation. I didn't have a time to ask myself what Peter would do, or John, or or Apostle Paul. Do I just you, acted. Yeah, and I yeah. was uh, loading the truck with the frozen chicken. So that's what I had in my hand. When I saw him making his move, trying to stab my friend, I just threw the, those chickens at the guy with all my mind. And I didn't know that I put so much effort into throwing those frozen chickens at this guy that it completely knocked him to the ground. And then I didn't wait a second. I jumped on him. I removed the knife from his hands and I grabbed him and I shook the guy violently and I yelled at him, what's wrong with you? Why would you want to murder another human being and for what? And guess what? He started to cry. Mm -hmm. He completely broke in front of me. So I helped him, you know, to stand up and, and we talked to the guy and I felt a little bit bad that I uh, knocked him with such a force, but I just did not know what else uh, to do. And and sometimes it's easy to strategize what would you do if such a situation would be unfolding in front of you. But when you're in the middle of that, you just act. You mm -hmm. just do what what you can. So I had multiple situations like this when there were knives involved, when there were people punching other people, trying to hurt others. Um, what do you do when um, three guys want to rape a, a girl in front of you? Like, what do you do? You pray? You call the police? When you call the police, it's over. It's done. It's mm -hmm. The deed is going to be done. Well, you got to act. I remember one time we arrived at the location and there were three guys stabbing another guy. I mean, knife in the back already. Um, I just, I didn't know what else to do except to run. To run towards the villains as fast as I could. And they were flying left and right. But I saved this man's life. And the paramedics came and they took the knife out and he was saved. You know, you just got to do your best and pray that God will somehow sort things out god you see what is a miracle and let's just talk about that yes, miracle yes. comes when you do your part when you act the red sea miracle that we call it what was that if not moses and the israelites acting their fate it was an impossible situation. Behind them were the Egyptians. On the left were the mountains. On the right were the mountains. In front of was the Red Sea. And God yells at Moses and says, why have you stopped? Keep moving. Well, God, don't you see there is a Red Sea? Don't you see that there's nowhere to go? No, wrong. With God, there is always a place to go. Fate moves mountains. And Moses stretches his staff. And what happens? Miracle happens. Mm. So we as Christians, we've, I think we bought a lie. We bought a lie that the only thing that God wants us to do to sit is to sit under a tree and pray. I believe this is one of the biggest lies that people have bought. We are not called to just sit and pray. We are not called to be Buddhas waiting for the people to come to you. We right. are called to be followers of Jesus Christ. So what did Jesus Christ do? Well, he walked. He went from village to village, from town to town. He preached the kingdom of his father. So he did something. He acted. Mm -hmm. He preached. He spoke the truth. And the Bible says the truth shall set the captives free. What else did he do? Oh, he sat under a tree and waited for the people to come to him? No. He did miracles signs and wonders 
as he, he, as he moved, as he walked. That's right. <laughs> also, he fed the poor. That's why they wanted to crown him king. Well, what a cool king that feeds us, right? <laughs> so uh, what else did he do? Well, he cast out demons out of people. Um, he did a Lord's Supper, right? As we call it right now. So he he had dinners with people. He visited people in their homes. Um, I think we have a wrong, wrong view on Christianity. I think we have bought a lie that rapture is going to happen and Jesus is going to rescue us from the tough times. I don't believe that. I believe that um, we will go through tough moments, difficult situations. Uh, you know, I'll go even further than that. During the time of the apostles, they were already going through tribulations. Right. Apostle Paul writes and he says they're, you know, sowing us into half. They are, you know, he was stoned, he was shipwrecked, he was hungry, he was naked, he was thirsty, he was dealing with robbers, bandits, um, he was, you know, whipped so many times, arrested, imprisoned, you name it. Tough times were happening during that time. They were happening during the Middle Ages. They're happening right now in China, North Korea, in Saudi Arabia and other places. Do you really think Westerner? That is not going to happen to you because why? You're so special because you're excluded from pick up your cross daily and follow me. Well, I don't find that in the Bible. I don't find Jesus sitting under a tree like a Buddha waiting for the people to come to him. I see Jesus on a move. I see Jesus going to the people mm -hmm. that took action, that took effort, that took organizing. Mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of different things were required for that to be unfolded so when you move when you act upon that faith miracles happen you see if i was not willing to go and feed the poor that god told us to do all those different things would not unfold it if i was not obedient to preach the gospel millions of people would never hear the gospel i literally and because of the international and national and local news, I was able to preach the gospel to hundreds of millions of people. And all of that, not because I'm so eloquent, you know, of a preacher, not because I'm a silver tongue and such a great orator. No, because I'm just a simple, ordinary guy that was willing to do what God called me to do. I was in the right place at the right time because God wanted me there during that time in that place for such a time as this. And I simply obeyed. And because I did, other doors were open. So here is faith. Faith tells you to move through one door. But when you do, multiple other doors open as well. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if they were just like 99% of the so-called Christians today, they would say, well, we got to obey the authorities. We have to obey the government. The government says bow before the golden image. God knows my heart. He knows I'm not really bowing. I'm just obeying the authorities. So let's be down with it and move with our lives. That's pretty much the reasoning that they were giving us in the past three years, why they bowed before Satan himself. Do not congregate. Well, in my Bible, it says, do not forsake the gatherings of the saints. Do not have Lord's Supper. Well, he says, when you meet together, you know, remember what I did, the blood and the body of Christ. Sing praises. Why? Because he dwells in the praises of his people. I'm not going to listen to a government that is woke, rogue, you know, satanistic that tells me I cannot meet and worship my God. I'm going to stick with the word of God. So, uh, they had a you know, they had a chance to save their lives other ways, you know, but they chose to die to themselves, to their ambitions. They chose the fire. And it, because they did that, they made that move, that step, that leap of faith. And what a testimony mm. that it yeah. came out of this. Remember Nebuchadnezzar said that whoever, when he saw the miracle, Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, everyone has to serve their God. Mm -hmm. People are desperately looking for miracles right now. This is era of miracles. People are looking for the real deal. They are looking for the real God. They are surrounded by idols, fake, you know, 
Pharaohs and and you know Caesars and all those psychopaths. They're looking for the real deal. Who is going to give it to them? And because they were willing to die, and Nebuchadnezzar and the whole entourage of people saw the miracle, the outcome was so fascinating because Nebuchadnezzar becomes the biggest, the biggest evangelist of all times. Like the guy evangelized the entire world and says, whoever speaks negatively or wrong about the God of Shadrach, Michigan, and Abednego, I'm going to chop them to pieces and, you know, destroy their whole house. Like, wow, cool. <laughs> From a prisoner in a fire to the highest offices in the land, and honor. being able to preach to the entire earth that's miracle and that's what god is looking for my get out video my uh, arrest in the middle of the highway all of that had one purpose that the people would see around the world the god is still god still sitting on the throne the god is god of miracles look anna they unleashed everything that this government has on me mm. money resources crown prosecutors every uh, police department rcmp rcmp is like your um fbi we um detectives undercover uniformed police minister of justice prime minister premier you name it was unleashed the minister of health unleashed on me and my family and yet i'm still talking to you and you don't see me depressed you don't see me suicidal you don't see me like oh poor me what happened to me because my god is bigger than all of their idols combined together <laughs> that's the miracle that god wants people to see amen and you know you spoke about satan and demons and we know that ephesians 6 says that we battle not against flesh and blood we battle against principalities spiritual wickedness in high places right these demonic principalities that we don't see i mean what else would possess a man out of nowhere to bring a butcher knife or to bring you know gangsters to come kill you in fact there's another story that i want you to share about this gentleman who brought a pistol he wanted to kill you personally threatened you that he was going to kill you the next time he saw you he was planning the next visit and then something miraculous happened the next morning after he threatened you what happened yeah, so we're in the front line, um, you know, tip of a spear, if you will. And the gospel is very offensive to the demons and to Satanists, to people that are evil or are doing evil. It's like it cuts like a double-edged sword and you must react, if you will. So there's a lot of times that we witnessed people reacting. Uh, prostitutes, for example, would strip naked in front of us just to stop the preaching. And this guy was observing me for a while. And because I had that penalty on my head, they were trying to murder me multiple times before. There were knives thrown at me. Well, he joined the club, if you will. And he comes to me. He says, I have a pistol right here. And the next time I see you, I'm going to shoot you myself. So next time you dare to come here, to this place you're dead and i just want you to know that i'm going to shoot you personally so i said oh boy this is a really serious threat and i knew because others other people from the homeless came to me and they said yes he really has a gun and he vowed to use it next time you show up and, and by the so way I, it's illegal to have a gun in canada right it's illegal so if elite gangsters they find a way to get it Oh, don't kid yourself. I was on the streets offered bazooka, machine guns, pistols. I can buy anything you want on the streets of Calgary. Drugs without interference of the of the police. Any gun, any weapon you want, Uzi, whatever you want, I can get it. And <laughs> the funny thing is, I was offered multiple times to buy illegal guns so there is no shortage of pistols revolvers and machine guns on the streets of calgary is that law-abiding citizens are not allowed to buy them but gangsters they have no problem of getting uh, illegal guns so this was obviously of course an illegal pistol that this guy had and uh, so i prayed because I knew that this threat was real. This was this was not just a you know whatever. I'm too drunk and I'll just 
you know, utter threats. I knew that he was very serious. I knew the guy. He was known in the area. And I prayed. And I said, God, if you don't want this guy to shoot me next time I show up, and I have to show up because you told me to, so I have no option. Please help me. So <laughs> I woke up in the morning after my prayer, and uh, I look in the newspapers, and behold, this guy's face is right in front of the newspapers, local newspapers in Calgary. What happened was the police did a raid on that area. And behold, they find out that he was in a possession of an illegal pistol. <laughs> he got arrested for possession wow. and some other drug-related um, the crime. So that's how God uh, rescued me. Another thing with a drug dealer. Yeah, go ahead. So the pistol that he was threatening you with to kill you is the pistol he got arrested for the next morning. You guys, if you think that you know, if people say that God is slow and he's slow, he's, he's not slow. He's always on time. He's on perfect timing. It's where that's slow. Literally, his timing is perfect. That That's a continue. That's amazing. No, wow. no, uh, you just opened some other door. So let me just... Uh, talk about this but it remind me about um, a drug um, dealer that came to kill me as well i'll share that story so it comes to timing uh, because what the canadian government did to me and to my family you know we were very successful business people we had seven houses we had properties i was golfing all the time driving sport cars i was making a lot of money and when god called me to a full-time ministry uh, he told me to leave everything behind. Literally, I had an office in Bankers Hall and I hear him, I hear his voice and he says, stand up, pack your stuff from your office and go out of Egypt and never come back. So that's what I did. That's how the ministry actually started when I left my office and millions of dollars uh, that I lost on my properties. But anyway, after 10 years of fighting with the Canadian government, I, they bankrupt me. They completely wiped me out to a point that I received a letter from the city of Calgary threatening to foreclosure my home. And they said, well, you have not been paying taxes, property taxes for three years, and we're going to put your house on a market. And, um, and that way we're going to, to get what you own. I was devastated, I have to tell you, because all my financial troubles had nothing to do with my bad decisions. I was actually very good at what I was doing as a businessman. Um, all my problems were because I obeyed God. So my financial trouble came because I said yes to Jesus and I did what he told me to do. So I was very frustrated and I was whining and complaining. And, uh, you know, my but wife, where, right now, but not to interrupt you, but that's where miracles happen when you're doing the, you're, the Lord's business, you're on the, you're about the father's business. That's where he can meet you and do another miracle. Go ahead. I love it. <laughs> That's right. You know, now I, I learned, I know better. And my wife, of course, is, she's such a good reminder and to me. She would say, quiet, stop it. Don't talk because I don't want to find out one day that we did not enter the promised land because of your whining and complaining. That's it. No more whining and complaining. You're not allowed to complain. Just do your job, do whatever God is telling you to do, and don't whine, don't complain. So um, I'm, I'm still learning, okay? I I'm, I did not achieve the perfection yet, but I'm learning. We're but all a work in progress, amen. That's right. <laughs> I still, you know, sometimes I still have my poor me pity parties. Um, but, you know, thank God for my wife. She snaps me out of it with a big, good slap in the head. So uh, going back to the story, they were almost ready to take our home. Mm. And we've lost our properties. We've lost our million dollar houses. And, and this was just a 900 square feet little shack, but it was a place to live. And I went to God and I started to whine and complain and like, God, I'm serving you and, and you're not paying my salary. What kind of a boss are you? I used to have a hundred people working for me and I would pay their salaries. I would give them bonuses. I'd take them to dinners, horseback riding. I would take them pay, paintballing. I would bring them coffees and donuts and, and you don't even pay my salary. What's wrong with you? What kind of a boss are you? I'm working for you seven years full time and you're not paying me. And now they are about to take my house away. So that was the whining and complaining I was doing. And he spoke to me. 
you know, <laughs> you know, most of the time he doesn't say anything that I would hear. He talks to me through nature. He talks to me through the word of God. When I read, a revelations will come. But from time to time, I'm telling you, I would hear him. And that was the time I've heard him. And he says, did they take, did they take your house away? And I said, uh, no, but there's letter and they are threatening to take. And he stops me and he says, did they take your house away? I said, no, but you see the letter, right? That they're, they're saying they're going, stop it. Did they take, so he says three times, did they take your house away? And I finally realized, okay, there's no arguing with him. Um, he has a point. So I have to shut up and just get it. And I said, no. Well, then I am not late, am I? I said, well, technically speaking, you're not late. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we established that. Guess what happened the next day? You get a phone I call. Got, I got a check for the exact amount to pay all of our debts. Wow. Regarding that affair. And of course, I didn't know that the check is coming. It was a surprise. We did, we were not expecting any checks to come, um, but it did. And uh, that was a very powerful lesson when I learned that God is never too late. Sometimes we just don't understand why certain things are happening in our lives, why uh, certain things are unfolding, but God is never late. Yes. We just He's don't understand. Perfectly... Yeah, we, we... we don't see the whole picture because he's perfectly on time. There's no, you know, timeline in heaven. There's just, there's no time. We have a beginning and an end here, but not in heaven. So he's outside of time. Hallelujah. I want yeah. to go back to that. Go ahead. No, I just want to show you something. Yes. Um, this is this is what happens, right? So uh, let, let me try it. So, can you see this? I can see that. What is that? Well, it's not fully in the camera. Like right? A, like a, uh -huh. So... But but how about now? Hmm. Yeah. See, that's the problem with God. Sometimes we only see just just a little bit, right? Just a little bit. We don't really know what's there. We see something, but God sees the whole picture. Yeah. He knows it's a lion. He knows the whole thing, but He is allowing us to only see a portion for that moment in time why because i tell you i tell you the truth that if god would show me my entire life when i said yes to jesus i probably would freak out and have a heart attack because if i knew i'm going to break a record of being arrested and being you know standing before the courts and being hunted down for 20 years and receiving 340 some citations i probably would not sign up if i knew i'm going to lose my properties and houses and millions of dollars i probably would say no that's not a good deal i don't like it but mm -hmm. god only showed us just a little bit and he led us when we entered through one door there were more doors opening and he led us through all of this and when i looked from the perspective of time I don't regret a thing Amen. because I know that I know that God is my rewarder. I know that I know that in the end of the day, God is going to repay what the locusts have eaten, mm -hmm. what the enemy have stolen. In the end of the day, God says that I have not seen, the ear have not heard what the mighty things God has pre prepared for those that love him. You see, Anna, the thing is, that, you know, we're here just, for a second really but few moments like like like, like, like the flowers on the fields and then we wither away eternity is forever and ever it never ends eternity we're going to spend with god that is love and he has prepared amazing things for us a god that creates not only this universe but he creates universes he creates galaxies and he never stopped creating things amen he's always moving amen just like in the bible it says in genesis that his spirit was hovering over the void of the earth he's always in movement that's why we we're always supposed to be in movement with him 
as well. We're going to get back to the drug dealer story in a second. But while you were talking about the lion and how the Lord speaks to you through nature, you're very well known by saying lions don't bow down to hyenas. And the Lord ended up giving you a revelation on lions when you were watching and observing lions hunting in nature. Yeah, that's, um, again, um, I'll tell you the whole story because I probably yes. never shared it um, on the a, on a shows. Um, that was 2003, and we were already in the streets, and a friend of mine came from Africa, from Kenya. And over there, he met a guy that was just kicked out from a church. His name is Jasper, and he was kicked out from his church, his crime evangelism he was told that this denomination that he's part of doesn't evangelize us on the street so they told him to stop two children wife and a passion for christ to go out and uh, outside and preach the gospel but he was told not to do it but he did not obey them he kept preaching and eventually they fired him for preaching the gospel on the streets they fired him so a pastor gets fired. My friend meets him, likes him so much that he comes back with a story. And we as a church, we decided, you know what? I like this guy. I like his boldness and his willingness to pay the price. He sounds like us. So let's support him. Let's support this guy with a monthly, monthly, you know, a few dollars um, I don't remember how much we were sending him at the very beginning. And let's see what he does with the money. So we were giving him, I asked the guy, tell me how much he needs, two children and a wife to pay all his bills. And we will provide for all his bills and a food. And that's that's the only thing we're going to do. And let's see what he does with the money. And guess what? The moment he started to receive the funds, he started to gather around himself a group of, group of people that were preaching with him. Then they purchased a speaker, then they grew, and then he asked for more a year later. So we sent him more money. He opened a church. A church grew to 100, 200, 500. Then we sent him more money. He purchased his own building. Then it was 2,000 members. Guess what? Right now, the guy has one of the biggest churches in the entire country with multiple campuses, with his own children's school, with buses, with evangelism that has 10, 20,000 people in his city. So anyway, eventually, a few years later, we went to see what he accomplished with our money. Wow. And I took my son, Nathaniel, there. Uh, my brother David went and um, we preached in uh, Nairobi. We preached in Kisumu and other places. We did the crusades. And then we had a few days just to relax and go on a safari to see nature. And it was there when we were sitting over there observing lions that I had this revelation. And here is the revelation. What I observed was that the moment lionesses or lions show up, the birds stop chirping. The monkeys stop talking and swinging. The moment the lions show up, the entire nature is on pause. And the majesty of their entrance, the way they communicate, the way they walk, the way they showed everywhere we own this, Savannah is ours. I can't shake that image away from me. The majesty of those animals, the kings in a savanna, the kings of the jungle, it was absolutely unbelievable. And then when we were sitting there, because we spent a few days uh, in a savanna, uh, we witnessed the lions hunt and the way they move, the unity among themselves. Every lioness knew where to go and what to do. It was a fascinating thing. And so God was speaking to me that that's exactly how he wants his children to behave. We are the sons and the daughters of the most high King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jesus Christ 
is the lion from the tribe of Judah. We are to understand that God is the owner. He is the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is everything. He's life itself. And if we are with him, if we are part of his family, the same heritage or inheritance belongs to, to us as well. So the first revelation you need to know, the number one thing that you need to understand is who our God is how powerful he is, who he really is, and that there is nothing and no one that can stop him. You see, there is no wrestling between God and Satan. Satan, what was the last time you talked, you taught mm -hmm. about dust under your feet? You don't pay attention. You just walk on dust and that's it. You don't care. Well, the Satan is a creative being just like we are as well. He's a creative being. And I know what you're talking about, that picture, and I'm going to have it up right now where Jesus is wrestling the devil. And I remember going, wow, yeah, I know Jesus always wins, but it's not even wrestling, right? He's not no, even wrestling no, the devil. No, this is a lie. This picture is a, such a lie because this picture implies that there is a struggle between Satan and God. There is no such a thing. When was the last time you were wrestling with an ant or a cockroach? There's no wrestling. You step on it and it's over. It's done. That's what God, you see, you can't compare creation to a creator. You see, this, this is creation. There is no wrestling between Arthur Pulaski and a pen. I can do whatever I want with this pen. This pen only is useful and exists because I want this pen to be useful to me. And I want this pen to exist. I can throw it. I can burn it. I can break it. I can discard it at any moment I want to. Satan is just a tool in the hands of the living God for a purpose. Sometimes we don't understand that purpose, but nevertheless, Satan is just a useful idiot in the hands of a powerful God that have chosen to use him for time um, and, you know, for testing, I would say. And the second most powerful thing is that's where the lions come uh, to. The second most powerful thing that we have to understand is who we are in Christ, how powerful we are and greater things than I, you shall be doing as well. So who is an assassin? Who is the guy with a pistol? Who is the, you know, high ranking police officer, um, responsible for the stink operation? Who is that judge? Who is that crown prosecutor? Who is the prime minister, president? Who is the governor? Who is the mayor? In the end of the day, they are just people, humans that have been created for God's purpose in the end of the day. But we as Christians, we must understand who we are in Christ. We are the sons and the daughters of the Most High God. We are the sons and daughters of Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, life itself, the truth that sets the captives free. So when you have that revelation, when I watch those lions and I watch them multiple times during number of visits that we had, those lions... They know who they are. I think Christians do not know who they are. That's why they're beaten. That's why they are under the boots of the hyenas. They just don't understand. I witnessed hyenas approaching lions and lions didn't even bother to open their eyes. They were just laying there. It's like, ah, oh, whatever. Just, it's just a hyena. It's just, it's just a hyena. We must understand who our God is, and we must understand who we are in God. We are the rightful owners of the savannah. When you have that understanding, then you walk with a head high, and you have this revelation that everything I see, including my enemies, my father owns. I'll give you that revelation I had. Uh, of course, I went a little bit over overboard with that because that was such a big revelation and i was very young christian then but i remember god showed me that we are the owners of everything on earth that he has given us that dominion because of the blood and because of the cross because of the name that is above every other name so i remember i had that revelation actually it's first corinthians 3 21 god has given us all things it's in it's in psalms as well but first corinthians 3 21 amen 
So oh. I went with my wife, and I, I don't think she will ever forget that, um, into a restaurant many, many years ago. I was still a baby Christian. And um, oh, we talked with a waitress, and and I said, well, uh, my father owns this restaurant, by the way, <laughs> so, with such a foolishness. And she said, oh, really? And uh, she says, oh, I didn't know that. I said, yeah, my father owns it all, everything, all the restaurants. Every city, every car. You see, the revelation in my mind was so big, so overwhelming that I, whatever I looked at, whatever I saw, I knew that in the end of the day, God owns it all. You see, the Soros, the Bidens, the Clintons, the Obamas, the Rothschilds, or whatever those psychopathic bloody murders demon possessed are, they think they own things. But in the end of the day, and I remember their days are numbered. They are only here like cockroaches for a purpose. Sometimes I don't understand why. What is the purpose of cockroaches? But hey, they are here for a purpose. I, I, yeah, I always wonder, I'm like, well, Lord, why did you create mosquitoes? And I realized he created them to uh, test our patients, to help grow our patients. <laughs> I actually watched a documentary, Anna, about mosquitoes, and that's why I understood that everything that God created has a perfect purpose. You know, without mosquitoes, you would die? I did not know that. What? Because mosquitoes are food. Mosquitoes by the trillions, quadrillions, whatever, are food for the birds, for the bats, for all kinds of... Uh, other creatures and the other creatures are food for other creatures and then other creatures are eating them and then we eat you know <laughs> the cows and and then you know the chickens and all those other things so without mosquitoes i watched the documentary the whole life cycle circle of life would end and we would we would die you see those um um spiders they need mosquitoes those other creatures that we don't like so much but they eat all of that stuff when that food supply would stop well other it would disrupt food would stop as well and the chain reaction would be our our destruction so i learned that even though i don't like certain creatures including bidens and obamas and clintons and schwabs and sorrows and gates i don't like those different creatures but i know that in the end of the day god is keeping them still for a purpose i may not see that purpose i may only see the little piece of the puzzle but i know that god has everything covered in other words and miracles do happen when you invite god of miracles into your life when you do when you obey things started to move and you say like wow i didn't see that one coming you see when i walked out of the court i walked out of that courtroom against all odds i was told by the politicians by the media by the most powerful people in the land that i'm not coming out but i did why because god is more powerful than all of those minions combined together that God is more powerful than all the demons and Satan himself. There is no wrestling between my Jesus, my God, and Satan. If God wanted Satan to be gone, it would be like this. Are you ready? <laughs> That's it. It would be would be over. I don't think he would even, you know, do this with his fingers. I think he would just say the words and and would be would and be down with. Amen. Well, you know, speaking of the Soros's and the Obamas and the Clintons and the Bidens, you know, we're at the end of the day, God doesn't want anyone to perish, right? We're praying for their souls because I always tell people it could have been, it could have been us. I mean, I know we're not like as wicked, but without Jesus, we're all dirty rags. We're all wicked, right? But obviously there's different levels of wickedness and demon possession is real and being deceived and being manipulated is real. So we're praying for their souls. Um, and then I want you to talk about that drug dealer story that you, that you, you had someone, a drug dealer coming to kill you. And what happened? What did the, what other miracle did the Lord do? So <clears throat> I uncovered a drug dealing business in one of the shelters uh actually the biggest shelter we have in the province of alberta 1000 homeless people and the drug dealer or the head of the enterprise was the head a staffer that was working 
for the homeless shelter. He was the head of um, of all the other uh, people, and he was selling drugs to the people that he was supposed to help, and he was hiding them in within the facility uh, by the refrigerators. So I knew that, and I started to talk about this publicly. And he got so upset that he hired assassins on my life. And so one day I got a phone call. I know, let's go back a little bit with the story. So I'm on the streets um, a month before uh, helping people. And there is this one guy that just got released from 20 years serving in prison. So he got released and he needed help and had some tools and had some you know, opportunity to help him. So I um, drove his staff, we rented a, a basement for him, and I donated tools for his work worth lots of money to him. I give it to him and I said, well, you know, you can start in a completely new life. And he was very grateful. He was crying. He was very grateful. He has never seen such a kindness before. And I moved on. I didn't really think much about it. You know, you deal with so many people all the time. But a few months later, he calls me and he says, um, Pastor Arthur, I um, I just have to talk to you. I just got a contract on you. And I said, you know, what contract? <laughs> so I was a construction worker. I was building houses. So that was a contract that I would get <laughs> to build a house. And I, I said, what kind of a contract? Well, they're giving me $5,000 to kill you. I said, like, who? <laughs> like, why? What have I done? Well, you're interfering with their drug trafficking business. And they hired me for $5,000 to kill you. And I said, okay, and what are you going to do? And he said, well, but I can't kill you. I love you, man. I can't kill you. So I said, so you're not going to do it? He says, no. But I said to him, okay, if you're not going to do it, you know they're going to find someone else that will do it, right? Because if you will not do it, they will give that money to someone that will have no problem to do it. You must go to the police. And he says, sorry, I can't. There is a code that we have criminals that we do not go to the police. Never, ever. I said, well, well, then I am as good as that, am I? And he says, there is nothing you can do about it. But I gave him a little bit of time and he calls me back and he says, okay, fine, I will go to the police. So believe it or not, he breaks his own code. He goes to the police. The guy that hired him for $5,000 was arrested like four in the morning by anti-terrorists and was charged. Going back to the guy that was selling drugs in the biggest um, you know, shelter in the province, um, I had to watch my bike. My brother David was acting as my bodyguard for about six months. The homeless were coming to me and they said, well, there is an open contract on you. They are trying to kill you. Watch your back. And truly, there were some sketchy people. There were knives thrown and all kinds of different things happening. I had two people watching my back when I was preaching. And one day, the head guy, the very guy that I was exposing that was selling the drugs, he marches on towards me. And I said, that's it. That's God you know, into into thy hands, I give my soul. And, and uh, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but he was marching on straight to me. And I wanted to turn the camera because the camera was focusing on worship. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, okay, I need to turn the camera. So if he kills me, at least he's on camera. But I give up that idea and just whatever, God, whatever you you have planned for me. And he comes and he hugs me like a big bear hug and he keeps hugging me and starts to cry and i said what happened he said i just want you to know that i am so sorry for all the grief i caused you and for the willingness to hurt you this morning my girlfriend took me to a church and i received jesus this morning <laughs> what are, what are the odds right what are the odds and um, and this is pretty much my life story. Every time enemy wants to hurt me, yeah. a huge blessing 
comes out of it. When I was in solitary confinement and metal cages and the inmates saw how I was being treated, I have become so popular in jail that I had every man, when I was finally released from solitary, I had every man at my tables for Bible studies and church services. If the enemy was not trying so hard to hurt me, the inmates would not see what is going on and i would not become so popular they were banging on the doors free pastor art and they were praying they were coming to my cell i was praying for them and guess what i led a number of them to the lord and i mean hardcore criminals drug addicts drug dealers bank robbers murders for hire tears coming uh, one of the big miracles in prison was when this guy had a, a, a car run him over and his bones were separated in his leg, completely separated. So he was supposed to have a surgery. And I said to him, you know, before you have your surgery, let me lay hands on you and let, let me pray, see what God will do. Yeah, so I did. Yeah. No, nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nothing physically happened until he went to the doctor for his operation. And guess what? He comes back and he says, my doctor told me that she has never seen in the entire practice bones coming together on their own. Wow. They went on their own and attached to themselves. And he says, we don't need an operation anymore. And she could not figure it out uh, what happened. You see, God is God of signs and wonders. He is God of miracles. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our Lord God, he says in his word, I am God, I do not change. Let every man be a liar, but God is impossible. It's impossible for him uh, to lie. So um, miracles, signs, and wonders is part of the journey. Um, what happened to me, what happened to our son, Nathaniel, as you know, he was born with a heart on opposite side, smashed lungs, bowels on top. He was born dead. God revived him. The heart after prayer moved to its natural place within two hours and the lung that was not there showed up, mm. you know, so, so that's a, that's a story of, of our lives. Um, yeah. and, and by the way, with that story, if you guys want to watch it, I highly recommend you watch this heartfelt testimony that Pastor Archer has. He shared it at Pastor Ramiro Pena's church. I'm going to have the link down below. Make sure you watch it after this one because it will get your get your tissue box ready because miraculous stories. And you'll hear Pastor Archer's background where he was living in the Soviet Union, where he was living in, in Poland and, you know, he's doing on the black market and he was a very successful business guy making a lot of money and his wife got saved and he was a hardened, you know, drinking all the time and miserable and then had an insanely amazing encounter with Jesus, with Yeshua and with his miracle son, Nathaniel, who I love and adore your son and your wife, be precious family. You got to hear this testimony after this. Um, but you were going to say something before we, we close out with the prophecy. Yeah, so uh, just the, the final one. Um, probably you don't know that we almost lost our second son, Gabriel. Mm. So we got three children. We got Nathaniel, Gabriel, and Maya. Maya is the daughter, the youngest. But when my wife was pregnant with Gabriel, she had a miscarriage. and She was bleeding like crazy, and the doctors could not stop the bleeding and they came and they said well there's really nothing we can do we and i started to cry because we just went through hell with our first son and now i said god please don't do this to us again i mean this was a most horrifying experience watching your firstborn son being born dead and then revived and all the problems and all the things that happened and it, it was a very traumatizing experience and we were hoping that this will never happen again but she was bleeding they could not stop the bleeding and they said uh, you might uh, it's 50 50 and i remember crying and and then god spoke to me and he says why, why haven't you prayed and ask me to to fix this problem and i said oh i guess i didn't so i went straight to her she was laying blood everywhere she's laying on the on the bed in a, a emergency um, in hospital 
I lay hands on her and I said, in the name of Jesus, I command this bleeding to stop. And guess what? It stopped. <laughs> it stopped like this. Wow. We uh, She puts her clothes back and we go home and Gabriel is 18 years old right now. So miracles do happen. And sometimes I wish they were happening more often. Sometimes I wish that every time we pray, God would answer the way we want him to answer. But in the end of the day, we got to remember he is the king. He is the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He does whatever he wants. We only see a little bit of that puzzle or the picture. He sees the whole thing. Sometimes I don't understand him. Sometimes I don't understand why more healings do not happen, why people die, why there is misery uh, but in the end of the day one day god is going to reveal it to us why all the whys will be known to us amen we will see everything instead of saying why just be thankful you don't have to know all the details and all the secrets you will see it one day in heaven to end this pastor i want to play this prophecy that was spoken over you by a prophet when you were thinking during all the persecution in Canada, you thought, man, wouldn't it be amazing to go to America? It would be so much more, it would be easier for me and my family, right? And this prophet spoke this word over you and I want you to talk about it. And the spirit of God says, this is going to be a time where I'm shifting your mantle. I'm going to show you, I can take you from ministry to government and ministry in a second. And the Lord says, what tried to chase you out, you will chase out, says the Lord. Son, do you want to be a man like Elijah who sits in a cave and says, Lord, I can't do this anymore. And the Lord says, for everyone that won't, there are 7,000 that will. You ran away from old communist roots, not to come into a nation and face communist roots in front of you. So the spirit of God says you are a John the Baptist and the Lord says you can't help yourself for the spirit of God says when you say I'm no longer going to speak the fire is too much shut up in your bones and the Lord says you cannot hold it back says the spirit of God it's too easy to move to America it's too easy under that government mantle is the priest as well and where there's a tug of war which one goes first the lord says both are going to flow together in this incubation period incredible that was prophet tommy Ariomi, who prophesied to you that even though you're wanting to go to america the same principalities that are chasing you here in Canada are going to follow you to America because of the calling on your life. What does that prophecy mean to you? As you remember, I was offered to move to United States. I was offered to go to America and they would relocate us. I was offered jobs and all kinds of different things about American people. And um, <laughs> God is just, I was you know, as you know, I said no to the offers. I said, I'm not going to go because God told me to go back to Canada and fight for Canadian children. And that was actually my last speech before I was arrested in um, in the States. When I arrived, as you remember, I was immediately arrested on the tarmac, uh, stepping out of the plane. Um, so those offers were good, were real. And God kind of reminds me or reminded me during that prophetic word that uh, don't even consider it. I've called you where I've called you and you stick to the plan. You're called for Canada. You're called here for such a time as this. And if you go to United States because you think it will be easier, uh, well, the same demons, uh, the same spirits will be chasing you there because Jezebel hates mm -hmm. The prophetic voice hates those that are, you know, standing for God and and in in a prophetic way. Um. So also because this is just a, a portion of that prophetic. There's more mm -hmm. in the entire video. It was about ten minutes or so. Um. And he said he was talking about politics. He was talking that God has chose. He has chosen us to stand in a political realm. 
to be that voice for the people, to uh, bring a reformation, uh, to do it with the both anointings, both mentals, the priest and the governor at the same time, uh, like like the the you know the people of old. Um, so there's a lots of things that he was speaking about that only God knew. Um, you got to remember, I was just released from prison when he spoke those words. And I was still on house arrest. To be there, I had to get a special permission from my probation officer to be able to attend that meeting. How crazy is that? I was um, under ho uh, house arrest from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. So when he was speaking those different things, it was very powerful because it confirmed everything that God has been speaking to us through this entire ordeal, politics, uh, prophetic, standing, anointing, that God is with us, that he has a plan, that there is a purpose, that everything that is happening is not a random. There is a logic behind everything. Because sometimes you're questioning God, especially when the miracles don't come, the way you want them to come. When I was locked like an animal, I wanted the miracle to come fast, right? Let this ordeal end, but it was not ending. Mm -hmm. I spent 50 days in hell. And you're sometimes wondering what is going on when they put me in metal cages. I said, God, they're going to kill me here. I, where are you? Like, come on, come to the rescue before it's too late. But again, we're going back to the same thing. God is never too late. God does everything at the precise moment, in a precise timeline. Why this is important that he allowed me to go through this experience? Because that experience exposed the villains, what they're capable of, who they are, that they are really not standing for law and order, that they are criminals disguising themselves as elected officials or judges or police officers. And it's, it's quite interesting um, because I am, we hired already an entire law firm to go after the villains. What they've done to me in prison, the arrests, the invasion on our church, the charges, the made up stuff. We are suing the Canadian government, police services, Alberta Health Services, and probably the courts for all the evil things they have done to us. So the puzzle is getting bigger and bigger and more, the picture is more visible. And all of that only could happen, only could happen when I was willing to go through the entire ordeal. So sometimes you want the miracles to happen, but you have not walked the entire journey. You the miracle cannot, yeah, right? You have, Go ahead. No, I was going to say, sorry, there's a little bit of a lag. Um, yeah, because people don't want to take that first step of faith. They're scared. They're worried. The fear of man instead of having the fear of God. And not just one step. You're going to keep taking those little steps mm. of faith. You see, people come to us and they say, oh, how come you're so bold? How come you're courageous? Listen, it took us 30 years of decisions, one step at the time one little step of faith, one little decision here and there. It's like building muscles. You you don't become Arnold Schwarzenegger overnight because you pumped yourself with some kind of a, a juice. You have to put the effort. You have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You have to have faith. And first, God will give you a little, a test. He's going to see if you're faithful with little. If you are faithful with little, he's going to give you more and more and more and more. When he was testing us, I was able to preach to few people, then few hundred, then few thousand. Then he allowed me to preach to millions at the same time and, and then back to few. Sometimes I'll preach to five, seven people, and that's fine. That's okay. It keeps us humble. Sometimes he allows me to preach to thousands. Thank you, Jesus, Man. for whatever you're doing. All the glory to you. If I can be useful talking to one, 
Thank you, Jesus. If I can be useful talking to a million, thank you, Jesus. In the end of the day, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. You see, it starts with him and ends with him. And there is a lot of dust between. That's you and me. Amen. To end this, I want to say that your life really could be a movie. And in fact, that's what the Lord showed. That you're going to God's going to there's gonna be a movie on your life and also a documentary as well about your life to wrap this up, to end this. If people were wondering, what are you doing now? What, what are you asked? What are your aspirations? What do you feel the Lord is leading you uh, to do right now? I know that, um, you know, there, you started a new political party where you have the fixers coming in, trying to bribe you to stop doing what you're doing. Um, talk a little bit about that. What are you doing right now? Yeah, so uh, number one, I'm still a pastor. I have no intention of stopping being a pastor. I said that to the people that elected me to be, you know, leader of the political movement here. I've told them at the very beginning, I have no intention of stopping preaching the gospel and being a pastor. If you want a politician that is a pastor, also, I'm your man. If you don't want me to preach, I'm not your man. Go and find some snake that will, uh, you know, keep lying to you. Um, and, you know, manipulating you. Um, so we started a political movement called the Solidarity Movement of Canada and Solidarity Movement of Alberta. Solidarity Movement of Alberta is a political entity registered as a political party uh, within the province of Alberta. We're growing. We have town hall meetings. It's actually uh, getting really, really uh, amazing. Uh, we're moving forward. Also, I still pastor two churches. So we three times a week, we feed the homeless, thousands of them on the streets of Calgary. We preach. We have a church service for the poorest of the poor. And three times a week, we meet in a church building. So I also a pastor reg, regular church in a building where I love to teach history and also theology. It kind of in a, a different way. I'm not your typical pastor that will be telling you every five minutes God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. I want people to know that being a believer, it will cost you your life. That uh, saying yes to Jesus, you're saying no to yourself. That uh, signing this contract, it's signed by the precious blood of Jesus and he means business. When he says, pick up your cross daily, that means is everything or nothing, left or right. You cannot sit on a fence. And that robs some people in a wrong way, especially Canadians, because they're not used to that kind of a preaching. Uh, here in Canada, people are used to fast for, you know, fast food Christianity, fast sermons, gluten-free donuts and a coffee machine in the churches well in our church you will not find those things in our church is a hardcore preaching that leads you to the cross i always say to the people a good preacher is a killer it kills your ego it kills your ambitions it kills your plans and leads you right into the cross and i quite often say to the people if you have a problem with being crucified if you cannot do it yourself i'll gladly nail you to that cross myself you need to die you need to die if you want to be useful in the kingdom of god you must die but when you do that's where you're truly going to live that's the fascinating part of the kingdom of the living god when you are willing to give everything up that's where you will gain everything when you're not willing to keep your worldly life and worldly possessions that's where the true riches true riches uh, will come your way uh, so that's what i do we're very busy you know feeding thousands of people and preaching the gospel running to churches raising the funds and also uh, being politically involved and meeting people and town halls and all kinds of different uh, events that are happening as a leader of a political party you know you just you do press conferences and you know you do uh, talk about things that other politicians refuse to I talk about there's one more thing that i would like you to participate in and pray and support if you can mm -hmm. um i am almost done with a book i wrote a book in prison with you know every day what happened during that ordeal why the sermons that got me imprisoned and all kinds of different things um but i struggle with time i always I always try to do the, you know, catch up 
fight fighting for another hour uh, of time and if you can pray that god would give me that mercy so i can have the time and finish that project and, and just move on also we hired lawyers to sue the canadian government like i said before tomorrow morning actually 11 o'clock i have a meeting uh, with the lawyer to uh, give some more information that he needs for the lawsuit and if you want to be part of that or if you want to be part of feeding of the homeless uh, go to streetchurch.ca streetchurch.ca and there are ways that you can become part of what we're doing and we're very busy and we keep plowing and of course the bible says when you put your hands into a plow you don't look back so i don't i don't have you know i don't have an intention to look back i'm focusing yeah. On the future i know great things are ahead of us i know that when you pass the test the test opens some unbelievable amazing doors and i'm looking forward to that praise god amen i was going to mention streetchurch.ca www.streetchurch.ca Wow, if you, I'm, if you, I'm telling you, these, this is fertile ground, right? We're fighting for the souls in Canada as well. I mean, really, communism, you grew up in communism, here you are again. But in Jesus' name, God is really shaking the country of Canada, really using one man and your whole family and your church. It really only takes one to save a nation we see in the Bible. You know, Queen Esther and and Moses and, and, and David, right? It takes one person to save a nation. I want to thank you, Pastor, for sharing these stories. I know that they've hit you with so many lawsuits. You have so many fines. I mean, millions and millions of dollars that you owe and you're paying off and people are, are generously donating and, and giving as well. So if you want to support this ministry, please do so. www.streetchurch.ca. Pastor Archer Pulaski, such an honor to have you here to meet your family. I've known you for years and I love you and I'm so happy to see you free. And I'm so excited to see what the Lord is going to do. And Father, we pray right now for this mighty man of God, his family and the whole church, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that you're going to send people, Lord God, you're going to send laborers, even more laborers, Lord, in the name of Jesus, to help write this book, Lord, to just be a servant, Lord, and help, Lord, to write, Lord God, and Pastor Archer just has to speak it, and this, and this person will write it, it'll edit it, it'll be supernatural, it'll be fast, in the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you for the, the, the redemption, Lord, as well, Lord God, not that we even need it, Lord God, but you do that, you're so good, Lord, when from the prison to the palace, Joseph went, from the prison to the palace, so Lord, I thank you from the prison, Lord, from the church jail, Lord God, to the government of Canada, Lord God, all for your glory, Lord, it takes one to save a nation, Father, we bless this mighty man of God, his wife, and his three kids, Lord, and again, his church that have been faithful, standing with him as well, Lord God, we thank you, we bless them, Lord, we thank you for the favor, the radical favor, Lord, the radical blessings, the, I mean, overflow to the point where he's going to even say, I, we can't take any more blessings, we have enough, we have enough, we are over flowing blessings lord we thank you for your overflowing grace and your overflowing protection all these miracle stories lord it has certainly you know brought such a joy in my spirit lord and brought so many people faith as well how good you are and encouraged all of us lord to be bold in the lord hallelujah hallelujah the bible says that when our ways delight the lord he makes peace with us even with our enemies there's peace father we give you the glory in Jesus name. Amen. Wow. <laughs> amen. Amen. And we do pray for our enemies. I do not hate my opponents. I pity them because I know that hell is real. Heaven is real. So pray for our oppressors that God would open their eyes and their ears so they can come and become our brothers and sisters. In Jesus name. From a Saul to a Paul. There's many that are already having that Damascus experience. So we pray for more in Canada, in America, in China, all over the world, in Israel, in the Middle East. God is truly going to get the full glory in Jesus name. You guys, thank you for watching. Amen.